Hello, everyone. I'm going to lecture now on the medieval theater. Um, the PowerPoint presentation is being shared right now on another screen, and um, you should be seeing the title page, Medieval Theater, The Summoning of Everyman, which is the play we're covering this week, and um, some images of what medieval theater looked like in performance here. This is an example of what was known as a pageant wagon, which I'm not lying with my mouse right now. The pageant wagon was kind of a mobile stage on which religious drama was often played, and uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit further in uh, the presentation this afternoon. But uh, you'll find that the medieval drama is rich in imagery and um, in uh, spirituality, certainly is one of the important functions of the medieval drama. And um, The Summoning of Every Man is an excellent embodiment of this kind of art form. So uh, let's continue. And we'll talk about the theater after the fall of Rome. Um, as you recall from last week in the module on the Greek theater, the, um, the Romans ultimately adapted uh, Greek theatrical forms and used them for their own purposes. Uh, when the Roman Empire fell to Germanic invaders in 450 uh, or in the 450s AD, uh, theatrical activity such as had been practiced on a large scale by the Romans had come pretty much to a halt, at least in the Western Empire. Uh, but during the periods of the Republic and the Empire, theater was an important part of life in ancient Rome. Plays were presented in the context of a ludus, or games in Latin, and what we commonly see in movies as gladiator spectacles and chariot races, all of those kinds of events would take, take place in the context of the ludus, and um, uh, plays, theatrical presentations, were often part of that. These things included gladiator fights, beast hunts, acrobats, bimes, comedians, and of course, the execution of Christians. And this background is important to understanding the medieval theater and what the Christian church's relationship was with the theater at the time. Uh, we find that in this period, acting was a profession, but not a reputable one in the time of ancient Rome. Uh, actors were often slaves, uh, although it was possible for actors to achieve uh, their freedom as freed men and earn um, great amounts of money and reputation and fame. Uh, for the most part, acting was a profession that you did not want your kids to go into. Uh, it was considered to be um, dishonorable and disreputable to exhibit oneself uh, in public for the sake of entertaining other people. Uh, during the Dark Ages, uh, which lasted from about uh, the 6th to 9th centuries AD, uh, certain types of performance practices persisted but plays on the scale as they were produced in ancient Greece and Rome were no longer produced. And among these practices include minstrelsy, mime, folk dancing, and later royal processions and tournaments. And so uh, there was a great deal of performance or performative activity in the Middle Ages and in the Dark Ages before the church starts to bring back a form of drama in the context of the liturgy. One of the great advances in our understanding of the theater and uh, our world in general in the last 50 years is the observation that performance pervades a great, many, very many aspects of our lives. Performance is um, a dynamic phenomenon that defines our social experiences and the way in which we express ourselves socially. And so anything that can be exhibited by people for other people is regarded as a performance. Although not all performances are theater or theatrical or dramatic, certainly all dramatic and theatrical performances are well, performances by definition. But this also includes uh, sporting events and uh, political debates, uh, religious rituals, and that's important to keep in mind as we look at the Middle Ages. Uh, all of these things are aspects of performance. And as we're gonna see, Later on in the semester, when we start talking about the performance of identity, um, race, gender, uh, ethnicity, and even religious identities are all species of performance, but that comes later in the semester. Um, 
And because of its association with pagan worship, the early and medieval Orthodox Christian Church condemned theater as a satanic practice. And this is important to keep in mind because uh, in addition to being fed to the lions in um, the context of the games, the Christians also believed that the Greek gods for whom the games were performed, in, honor, in whose honor uh, the games were performed, were actually demons in disguise. And so these uh, actors were participating in a satanic ritual, and anybody that went to see a play was uh, advocating for a demonic activity. So you see, the, uh, the theater was anathema to early Christians, and some of the, the best of the early Christian writings provides for us um, an interesting portrait of what the, the theater was like. Uh, for example, as Tertullian and St. John Chrysostom's in the second and um, third centuries, respectively, are railing against the theater, we are getting a very uh, important historical portrait of what the theater was like in those periods. But again, um, this is important to keep in mind because when the Christian church, the Orthodox Christian church, starts to bring back drama in the context of the liturgy, they are careful to define their activities as not being theatrical, as being religious in nature. Here's some notes on the medieval worldview. The Orthodox Christian Church, which is also known as the Roman Catholic Church, um, and in its, both of its forms is the Western Orthodox Church, which is Roman Catholic, and the Eastern Orthodox Church, which comprises a great many Catholic sects, but all of these um, denominations of Catholicism are related in some way, and some um, acknowledge the supremacy of the Pope, for example, others don't, but all are regarded as Catholic. But in any event, and this, all of this is taking place uh, around the time when the Church was splitting in what was called the Great Schism in Roman Western Orthodoxy and Eastern Greek Orthodoxy, and that schism still persists today. Um, but the Orthodox Christian Church before the schism uh, filled the vacuum of power that resulted when the Roman Empire fell. So instead of having um, Caesars, you had popes, and instead of having governors, there were bishops and dioceses. And so that vacuum of power was filled by the hierarchy, uh, the organizational hierarchy of the Catholic Church. Orthodox Christian theology profoundly shaped a medieval person's worldview. People in, these, in this time were uh, devout in their beliefs. They didn't have much going for them in this life, um, for the most part. And so the promise of a better world in, in the afterlife uh, was attractive to very many people, and so they took their religion very seriously. Um, however, they were open to paradox, and they saw the world in a nuanced way. So one example of the paradox that they accepted was that, for example, uh, Jesus was both God and man, and another paradox that they accepted was that um, he was born of a virgin, and um, another paradox that they accepted was that the, the Eucharist is literally the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So um, this is a very poetic and uh, nuanced way of thinking, but certainly it is anti-logical, um, but that is the nature of faith. Faith means that you believe in things that you don't fully understand or can't explain by scientific means. And again, faith is what uh, dominates the worldview of medieval people. Um, the flip side of that is the philosophy of ancient Greece and Rome, which the Christians of the early period of Christianity, also known as late antiquity, um, absorbed a lot of this thinking and incorporated it into Christianity. So um, the, philosophy, the philosophy of Plato was very important. Um, from his philosophy comes the idea of duality, the idea that the universe is really composed of matter and spirit, that fundamental ideas and essences inform matter, come down from the realm of the ideas and shape the individual elements and uh, things that we experience in this life. Leah, would you please be quiet? My dog is barking under the desk. Um, the idea that matter gets its essence, its thickness from the essential world of ideas, the world of forms. And this is where the, 
the idea of the world and the flesh come in, this split. And the spirit, the essential world, is much more real than this world, which is constantly changing and constantly becoming more and more corrupt, uh, constantly decaying, and eventually transforming into something that's unrecognizable. But the ideal world, the world of forms, never changes and is perfect. And this is how Christianity imbibed the idea of spirit and idea being pure and representing the best of our humanity and the physicality, uh, the material world being, stop it now, the material world uh, being uh, corrupt and uh, corrupting as well and corruptible. And here are pictures of little Plato of Athens and Jesus of Nazareth, a painting of the resurrection. The function of medieval art, medieval art um, had many purposes. Um, it was didactic, which means that its purpose was to teach. Uh, because most people were illiterate, they had no way of really understanding uh, or, or studying their religion firsthand. They had just knew what they could get from priests. But uh, things like wall paintings and uh, music, Gregorian chant, and also these plays helped to teach the people uh, the precepts of uh, Orthodox Christian faith. Uh, the rhetorical function of medieval art is to persuade people that uh, what they are being taught is true and to offer a more rational argument uh, for the bases of faith and um, to persuade them again that uh, these things that uh, they're being taught are true and that um, there's a good reason to believe in them. Um, there is the historical component. Art was used to remind people of the history of the world from its creation and fall in Genesis to its redemption in Jesus Christ. And so the idea that the Bible is history and what we see in medieval art usually comes from the Bible, uh, people are also being uh, instructed into the, from their perspective, literal progression of history. And the culmination of that, of course, was the, uh, the coming of Jesus, the incarnation of Jesus, and his uh, death and resurrection. And um, for, the medieval, for the medieval people, history tends to be not linear, but more circular, runs in a spiral. Um, the same kind of things keep coming back over and over again. And um, they experience themselves not as being very removed from the events of the Bible, the gospel especially, but that these events continue to apply to them. So if you look at um, a lot of medieval painting and some medieval sculpture in theater, uh, you'll notice, for example, that the, um, the uh, paintings will often represent people in modern clothing um, or in the clothing of the period. And this is to signify that, excuse me, I have to let a dog in. Sorry about that. Um, where was I? Oh, that was to signify um, that the um, events that happened back then pertain to us today. So you'll see Roman soldiers dressed as medieval knights. You'll see the people gathered around the crucifix and the crucifixion addressed as medieval peasants. And this, again, is to send the message that we continue to be part of that history. Another purpose is the allegorical. Allegory means for the purpose of making concrete. And you'll see that um, this is what's going on in the play Everyman. Everyman is an allegory. Um, abstract ideas such as beauty and truth are turned into characters in allegories. Um, you'll see this sometimes in, in fables uh, in which animals will come to represent certain human traits and characteristics. Um, individual characters can represent or symbolize abstract ideas. It works the other way as well. But we'll see that when we get to Othello, how the characters of Desdemona and Iago embody good and evil respectively on an almost allegorical level and how in some sense Othello is the everyman in between. And in our play, which we're studying this week, everyman is 
the symbol, the allegorical representation of every person in the world who is going to ultimately face death. And the anagogical purpose means for the purpose of revealing. Art was a portal into the supernatural realm of heaven. Images beautifully executed have the power to provide a glimpse into the timeless immeasurable beauty of God in heaven. Art could also aid people in their prayer by providing a focus in their meditation. It enabled them to enter mentally and spiritually into a sacred space in which communication with God in one's heart was possible. Um, this raises the interesting point of images and statuary in Orthodox Christianity. Uh, one of the big arguments in Orthodox Christianity occurred in the 500s over the use of statues and images, and it was called the iconoclast controversy. Icons are images, the uh, created images, sculptures, paintings, and what have you. And the debate was over whether or not it was blasphemous to have these images on display in churches. Um, the argument was that uh, these images uh, constituted idolatry, and for people to pray before images of Mary or the saints or uh, the crucifix was to, again, worship an object and forget about God. But the argument was that Jesus himself made God manifest by being incarnated as a human being. As Jesus says in the gospel, uh, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And so that was one argument that the anti-iconoclasts made, and it, was, it happened under Pope Gregory the Great, where uh, the approval, the church gave approval to the use of images not as something that Christians pray to, but certainly something that Christians pray through or pray with. With They were meant to be used as tools to create in individuals a sense of affective piety, an important concept. Affective piety means that the art is placing you in the presence of the event, albeit in your imagination, but you go deep in a meditative state that allows you to go there in a sense, that you are present at the crucifixion, and subsequently you will feel the compunction, the, the, the pain, the sorrow, um, the agony of Jesus as he suffers on the cross. And all of that emotional approach to religious experience is all designed to... Um, make people better Christians, and the art was the vehicle for that. Okay, here's an example of it. Um, this is uh, the Transfiguration of Jesus. Uh, it's a 12th century icon from a monastery on Mount Sinai where um, it was believed that Moses received the law, the Ten Commandments. I notice that there's not any attempt here to reproduce um, three-dimensional accuracy the discovery of perspective in painting is going to come later uh, in the late 1400s, and that's going to trigger a whole change in the way in which scenes, scenery is developed in the theater. But um, you notice here that um, Jesus is prominently figured uh, in what is called a, a medorla. It is a, um, an image, an icon, an art that signifies uh, the holiness of the person, that he is from another world, this light from another dimension is shining on him. Uh, this is Moses here, this is the prophet Isaiah, and below would be the prophets, uh, the apostles Peter, uh, John, and James, respectively, uh, cowering before uh, this image of Jesus revealed in his glory uh, before uh, the time of his uh, death and resurrection. Uh, it's a powerful image that is um, meant to reproduce the description that is received from the gospel and to bring people into the presence of this event. All right, let's talk about some types of medieval theater. This is my homemade kombucha. Made it with ginger, it's outstanding. Liturgical drama was performed in the context of the Catholic mass or liturgy. Uh, the clergy represented the characters and reenacted the stories in different areas of the church. Costumes and props were simple. The material was sung or chanted 
the resurrection and the nativity were common themes. Now it's important to remember that they did not think of this as theater. They did not view what they were doing in this context as kind of any kind of a theatrical performance. They regarded this as an aspect of the liturgy, of the service, of the act of worship. But gradually, there was a greater, uh, there was more of these things being performed because they really gave people uh, a powerful sense of the ideas behind the particular religious holiday that was being studied or, or celebrated at the time. So there was a very powerful development in the mass itself. And when you look at the descriptions of these um, so-called liturgical dramas, it's it's almost impossible to, to not think of it as theater because it looks so theater-like in the way they describe what the individual characters are wearing, where they go, how they move, when they speak, how they speak, how they should gesture. Very theater-like, but they didn't regard it as theater because theater was satanic. Um, this idea of theater and evil gradually starts to become more and more disengaged as the Middle, e the Middle Ages go on. In England, they are performing what are called cycle plays, and uh, this harkens back to the beginning of our discussion about, uh, when I was talking about the pageant wagon. The cycle plays were performed in England during the Feast of Corpus Christi, which means the body of Christ. Um, this occurs in June, late in June. It's a summer festival. Um, it began with the procession of the Holy Eucharist through the streets, and um, usually the, um, uh, the Monsignor or, or the head of the parish or the bishop would be processing the golden uh, the, the Eucharist inside a golden um, chalice or um, sculpture called a, a monstrance, which is, has a sort of a glass viewing case, and the Eucharist sits in this, and there's a beautiful ornate uh, golden halo around it. And they would process it through the streets. Um, and then gradually, the members of the English trade guilds would present biblical stories on these events. Uh, and what happened was that they started to display the entire Bible, or as much of it as could possibly display, be displayed in, in you know, 24 to 48 hours. Um, each of the guilds would get their own story to tell, and usually uh, the guild's story would correspond with the kind of guild they were. So the... Um, the shipwrights, for example, the guys that made boats, would present uh, the story of Noah. Uh, the, they would build pageant wagons, which were these movable stages that I showed you earlier. And uh, they, were pulling, they would pull these wagons through town. In York, um, East Anglia, uh, East Chester, East, uh, yeah, East Chester, and uh, Wakefield were the four major towns in which these uh, plays were performed, and we have the scripts of these plays to this day. Um, sometimes they were, uh, the, the, the pageant wagons would move into a location where people were already situated waiting, and then it would move on to another location. Or sometimes they would be set up in a circle and people would move from pageant wagon to pageant wagon. Um, but it was always an enormous community event that took many weeks to prepare as the plays had to be written, and, um, and the sets had to be built. Of course, once they had the scripts in a particular town, they would bring them back. But often they added to them, and they expanded, and they would add uh, other stories, um, rewrite old ones. There was, a, uh, there was a constantly evolving creative process that occurred around these cycle plays. And um, the moving pageant wagon is kind of like the skene from the Greek theater. It's a scene house on wheels. And then the location in front of it, what they call the platea or the place, the location in front of it was just an empty space that was kind of like uh, the orchestra of the Greek theater. Another kind of play that they were doing were called miracle or saints plays. Uh, these plays celebrated the lives of saints and were performed on their feast days. Uh, representations of miracles were staged using sophisticated special effects known as secrets. And they could do some pretty cool stuff. Um, fire breathing, uh, dragons, um, they could do uh, effects that would make it look like water was being changed into wine. Now, there were some very interesting techniques, but they kept it secret. They wanted the audience to be uh, surprised, and, all good, and no, all good musicians 
uh, keep their trade secrets close to the vest. Um, the Passion Plays were very important. Uh, they were performed during Lent, before Easter. Uh, these plays depicted the final week of the life of Christ, culminating in his crucifixion. Uh, Jesus Christ Superstar is an example of a modern passion play. It was a rock opera written in 1969-1970. Uh, it was when the Brown album, as it was known, came out, uh, featuring Ian Gillen of Deep Purple in the role of Jesus. Uh, later, it went to Broadway. Ben Vereen played Judas Iscariot on Broadway, and a film was made of it. Uh, it's, um, it's really a magnificent piece of work and a good example of, uh, of the passion tradition. Um, check it out if you ever get a chance. There are morality plays in our, um, our play, Every Man is a Morality Play. Uh, these are usually allegorical in nature. They preach strong messages of conversion and repentance and represent the struggle of the soul in the face of temptation and sin. And what we're going to see in Every Man is a play of exactly this kind. Every Man is the story of all of us having to face our death and ultimately what we're going to do about it, um, how we are going to face our death, how we are going to go through life, how we are going to age, how our um, strength and beauty and five senses and eventually our wits will all be taken from us, will all be cast aside as we grow older. So it's an allegory, a metaphor for aging. And also... Uh, an important roadmap for what it takes to be absolved of one's sins to get into heaven from the Catholic Christian perspective. Um, I've observed that if you got rid of the entire catechism of the Catholic Church and all of the history and everything that was ever written about it, and all we had was this play, you could reconstruct most of what Catholics believe and practice in their faith from the play Every Man. So it does a really good job of teaching and uh, persuading its medieval audience. And how persuasive it is to a modern audience, of course, depends a lot on where the individual is coming from. But um, we will discuss that in our forum question about how applicable is this play to anyone who happens not to be Catholic in their belief. And finally, the other type of medieval theater that went on were farces and interludes. They were not religious in nature. These were usually body secular dramas, uh, sometimes written in the vernacular, which is the language of the people, French, English, what have you. Um, other times they were in Latin. Uh, they were based on uh, Roman models. They depicted foolish individuals caught up in the web of their own vices and ignorance. Interludes were formal entertainments presented at court usually involving dance, poetry, music, and organized around a theme. And uh, this is also a time when uh, performers are emerging and performance is becoming a profession. As the gradually emerging nobility of Europe is, well, they demand entertainment. And an industry emerges to begin to entertain these people. And um, in short order, uh, the theater is going to become a very important part of their entertainment. You see here an image of the medieval pageant wagon, as I showed you at the top of it. Here's an actor. Um, from the look of him, dressed as a scholar in scholarly robes, as you're going to see at the very beginning of Every Man. This is probably the opening of the play in which the scholar uh, or nuncio or messenger is calling everybody's attention to uh, the performance which is taking place up here on the platform stage. Uh, we notice that there are people represented looking out of the windows of the surrounding houses, the church prominently in the background. People gathered around. Um, these could be characters, but these are probably here. Um, knights or guards or local officials that are there to keep order in the substantial crowd. Uh, we can see that this was very much a um, very powerful and popular civic activity uh, that people very much enjoyed. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it's also very much a community theater style activity as um, all of the performances, performers were primarily local people. So it was a lot of fun to watch the baker and, um, and the members of his, his business and other, other bakers 
members of the guild uh, performing the Last Supper, which of course is about um, Jesus giving um, the bread to his apostles. Now, what we mean by performance conventions is what actors did um, during performance, how they performed, uh, where they performed, and what audiences could expect when they went to a performance. So um, closer to home performance conventions that you may be familiar with are going to the theater, picking up your ticket at the box office, waiting in the lobby, uh, receiving your program, being shown to your seat. Uh, the performance is happening on a stage. Usually you don't interact with what's going on on the stage and the the stage itself is a world removed from the world of the audience, and so we tend not to involve ourselves with, with that. You know, there's that separation. You know, all of these, again, are the uh, conventions of the modern theater. Uh, in those days, uh, audiences would gather in what we'll call bound spaces. Uh, these could be anything like the town square, for example, um, or inns, um, banquet halls, any space that was not intended to be used or constructed to be used as a theater is regarded as a found space. Uh, in my own theater work, uh, I have found that uh, found spaces are uh, very exciting and um, uh, they provide tremendously interesting opportunities for staging plays. If you have the right space and you merge it with the right performance, you get very, very powerful results. Um, they practice what was called simultaneous staging. Um, they would do these, um, they, they would take the different locations in a play and they would set them up variously around either the town square or the church. So here's the Temple of Jerusalem. This scaffold over here is going to be the River Jordan. This scaffold over here is going to be um, Herod's Palace. And the actors would move from place to place. In a church, the audience would be centralized. All of this would be happening around the audience. The altar also would be used as one of the locations. Um, and of course, the medieval churches didn't have pews. There was no seats. When you went to church in those days, you stood or you knelt, depending on what was going on in the liturgy. Um, the individual locations in the simultaneous staging setup, and this is what was used to stage every man, probably in a town square, uh, would have the mansion, the scene, the scene house itself, like we see from the pageant wagon, the thing on wheels, and the location in front, the platea, or the place. Pageant wagons could also be set up in circles and be, represent, uh, be used for simultaneous staging. Um, again, people could expect that place would be in, uh, performed on the occasion of important Christian feasts, such as Christmas and Easter and Corpus Christi, Christi and uh, dedicated to the honor of saints and martyrs. Uh, the costumes were generally simple, although specialty roles such as angels and demons could be quite elaborate. Um, we see also that they had the possibility of creating great special effects. Um, these were usually written by clergymen because clergymen were the only ones who were literate for the most part, aristocracy too. Um, the actors were all amateurs. Casts consist of clergymen and lay people. So again, community theater. The acting was very likely broad and declamatory, very hammy and expressive and um, almost operatic um, in order to get the message out and make sure that all of the people that are standing around can hear. Um, but there was not any attempt to subtly reproduce human behavior in a natural way, such as we see in uh, modern film and television. It just didn't matter. In fact, it was much more fun to watch people declaim and be big and theatrical. Um, it was often necessary for the director to be on stage uh, during the performance in order to prompt the actors who had forgotten lines and cues. Yeah, they, uh, there is an image, a very famous image from a medieval play that represents a guy and he's got a pointed hat and a book in his hand and a stick. And for a long time, nobody knew who this guy was. And then it was realized that he was the director. And his job there was he's on the stage pointing to the individual actors and letting them know when it was their turn to speak and 
handing them their lines and reading them their line that they didn't know the line. And they did this in performance because, you know, these were, again, amateurs. They, they just were not, this was not their thing. They were doing this as a public service, as, a, uh, as an act of worship. And so no one really minded that they weren't the best actors in the world. But they were out there having fun and the audience appreciated what they were watching because they just kept doing it year after year. Um, medieval stage technicians were capable of producing sophisticated special effects, uh, such as smoke and fire and um, hell mouths, which were dragon heads that sinners were dragged into by demons and uh, thrown into the uh, in, into this thing. Um, sometimes that we have on record in theater history of actions being burned when uh, the sulfur that they were using and the charcoals um, would blow up and they couldn't control it properly. Um, they could fly angels. There are descriptions in of, from the Middle Ages of tremendously beautiful special effects that required some serious engineering involving rotating spheres attached to the rafters of churches in which choirs of children were installed just like angels and mirrors that spread the candlelight around. Just absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous stuff that they could do. Um, the material for the plays was generally drawn from the Bible, the lives of saints, and other uh, religious and uh, devotional literature. And as I said, the audience was familiar with the stories and probably with the performers as well. Everybody was a member of the community. So this combined with the close proximity of the audience to the actors, and you saw how close the audience was to the actors uh, during the performance. Uh, this gave everything a, um, um, like a, a festival experience for um, the audience and the actors. A lot of fun for everybody. And so here's um, a little bit about Everyman. The play was originally written in Dutch around 1495 and later translated into English. It is a morality play of the allegorical nature. Uh, literary work which abstract ideas such as beauty are represented as characters and characters represent ideas and symbols. The purpose of the play is to encourage the audience to repent and seek absolution according to the theology of the Orthodox Christian Roman Catholic Church. And it was probably staged uh, using simultaneous mansion and platea style staging. And we see here an example, production still is every man and the character Goods, who is usually represented as a very wealthy, um, sometimes um, Middle Eastern or Far Eastern potentate to represent uh, the, you know, the great wealth of the world. Uh, the version that you'll be watching, if you choose to watch the YouTube video, is a college production. They made some very interesting choices in representing some of these allegorical characters. They used giant puppets. Um, this they borrowed uh, from the Japanese theater. There's a Japanese style of theater called Bunraku, in which large-scale puppets are controlled by three puppeteers, and the whole play is enacted by the puppets. In the version that you're going to watch, the play itself is, um, is done with these puppets, and every man is, I believe, played by a young woman. Um, and um, I'd like to know what you think of the production and the acting style. Um, not all of the videos are of the same quality of acting. And I think it's useful for us as we study the theater to see the different levels of production. So this college theater production is going to be very different from the highly polished professional version of Oedipus that you watched last week. Um, so I'd be, again, I'd be interested to hear what you think. And of course, it's very important to read the plays as well. Um, if anybody finds some links to other performance versions of any of these plays, I'd be very interested in seeing them and would uh, be very grateful if you shared them with the class. So I'm going to sign off for now. I want to thank you for um, uh, watching me today. If um, you were able to log in, if not, um, the video uh, will be posted uh, this afternoon.